Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our last major branch in the eukaryotic domain, the chordates. Now, uh, in this uh, series of lectures, uh, pay attention to you know major characteristics of chordates, uh, the different groups within the the chordate uh, taxon, and uh, pay attention to how humans sort of fit into this uh, evolutionary context of life. Now, one uh, important point to uh, make is that uh, occasionally you'll see you'll see some uh, purple arrows. Those will indicate uh, significant moments in time in chordate evolutionary history. So what is a chordate? Well, there are a few basic features that uh, all chordates have. Uh, all chordates have this notochord, sort of like a, a primitive flexible spine uh, to which uh, muscles can attach. Um, we have a, a dorsal hollow nerve cord, uh, which in us uh, serves as our, our spinal cord, um, a postanal tail, and pharyngeal gill slits. Now, You'll notice that uh, as you sit or stand there, you don't have a discernible tail. Uh, that's because it's highly reduced in uh, uh, humans. Um, your tail is uh, internal to your body, so uh, it's up you know, within uh, the regions of your uh, pelvis there. Uh, pharyngeal gill slits, um, while prominent uh, in fish, uh, in us have been converted to other uh, structures in the jaw uh, and neck. So uh, who exactly is a chordate? Well, um, any animal that has uh, a backbone, certainly, and some other uh, outliers uh, in the chordate group, um, and in, including us. Well, we're not. Well, we're outliers in a certain way, but uh, chordates nonetheless. All right. So uh, we have this branch um, that uh, adjoins us to uh, the other eukaryotes, but now we have uh, this uh, sort of chordate lineage with these individual groups. Now we'll. Uh, branch into some of these. Uh, some will certainly need to have uh, a little bit better knowledge of than others. But uh, there are chordates that actually don't have uh, a, a true spine uh, or they don't have a, a spinal column. So they'll have the, the nervous tissue but without uh, the vertebrae that we associate with a, a spinal uh, column. So um, these organisms do have a spinal cord uh, but uh, have very simple lifestyles. Um, with no brain uh, and um, only uh, cartilaginous uh, skeletons, um, they're really just fairly simple organisms that uh, are filter feeders. So um, those are you know the, the brainless, headless chordates. Nice. Well, let's talk about heads. Okay. Uh, at this point, we're going to branch into craniates, referring to the cranium. So these individuals have brains and have skulls. Nice. So a um, uh, primary feature is that they are chordates, again, with a head uh, and a brain. Nice. So uh, the lancelet, that uh, brainless um, chordate, brainless, uh, sp you know, spineless chordate, um, has uh, changed or modified over time uh, into, or its descendants have changed or modified into a uh, structure that is more in line with uh, what we consider uh, to be a vertebrate. Uh, the three different uh, regions of the brain, this uh, becoming the, the brain that's encapsulated uh, predominantly within the skull. Um, neural crests, eh, you may see something on this. It's just a, a region of cells in an early dividing embryo. There's that little flexible notochord, uh, but there are certain cells that become parts of the uh, skeleton. Uh, basal craniates, again, eh, you're probably not going to need to know um, much about these organisms, but uh, Predominantly, they're jawless fish, okay, so like lampreys. Now, uh, let's move on to the actual uh, vertebrates, organisms uh, within this chordate uh, group that have spinal cords, okay? So there is a head and a brain, nice, and a spinal, spinal cord with uh, ossified or calcified vertebrae. Uh, most of these organisms have jaws, and we call them nathostomes. Uh, let's see, jaws and their evolutionary significance. Well, why do you think jaws are important? Hmm, one might presume it has something to do with predation. Okay, so here we have early uh, vertebrates. So they're jawless, but for the most part, uh, the vertebrates we're going to be looking at are nathostomes. They have uh, these jaws. Okay, now in terms of uh, how do you get from jawless animals to animals with jaws? Well, it's just a rearrangement of uh, skeletal structures uh, provides opportunity for organisms to capture prey and eat them. Now, uh, the first type of um, 
organism that we'll look at here are the chondrichthyes or chondrichthians. Uh, chondro means cartilage, so these are uh, fish with cartilaginous skeletons. Predominantly, we think of uh, sharks, but you know you can include rays in there as well. Uh, but they are these jawed um, craniates uh, that have vertebrae and uh, a cartilaginous skeleton. So just recognize that uh, they have that skeleton. Uh, Osteichthyes, oste meaning uh, bone, so they ha they're the bony fish, ichthosis fish. So they're the bony fish. Um, so then they have a, a calcified skeleton rather than a cartilaginous skeleton. Two major groups. Uh, Actinopterygii, eh, probably not going to need to know anything about them. Uh, the one that's probably more pertinent to us is uh, Sarcopterygii, uh, the lobe fin fishes. Now there's uh, some uh, branches here of uh, these fish that um, are sort of, uh, again, outliers, uh, relatively rare fish. Uh, but what the significant group in, or the significant group here, are the tetrapods. Um, these include um, the ancestors to land animals. Now, uh, once we move the tetrapods, again, this is a major change uh, in the evolution of life. Uh, early ver vertebrates were all uh, aquatic species, but now we're starting to move to animals that live on land, uh, breathing oxygen from the air. So major changes here. Uh, so um, we have these jawed animals, these nathostomes, uh, that have uh, four limbs and are uh, spreading into new niches. Okay. Um, interesting example of this, uh, Tiktaalik, uh, this uh, particular species or this specimen was found uh, in northern Canada inside the Arctic Circle. Um, it has characteristics that are fish-like, uh, but it also possesses features uh, that are seen in uh, land animals as well. So this is considered to be a, a transitional uh, fossil. So there you see a bone structure that starts to look more similar to uh, one possessed by us. Now the first group of uh, tetrapods that we'll look at here are the amphibians. Um, the only thing you really need to recognize is the amphibians. Okay, they're amphi meaning both, bio is life. So they live part of their life cycle in water, part on land. Again, sort of makes sense with the transition from uh, aquatic species to tetrapods. Now amniotes uh, come along next. These organisms, um, their eggs, uh, per, um, contain a, a fluid or this amniotic fluid uh, within the egg. Now um, what this does is put the organisms uh, in shells that uh, allow them to have uh, additional nutrition. You know there's going to be this yolk sac uh, that provides uh, nutrition to the shelled animal and this allows for uh, further development. You know uh, having this uh, shock absorbing uh, egg uh, with plenty of uh, nutrients gives organisms uh, again greater time to diversify and develop. Uh, let's see. Do, do, do. Uh, next we have the reptiles. Now again think of the progression that we're going with here. Amphibians uh, live part of their life uh, in water, part on land. Once we move to amniotic organisms, hey everything's all sealed up in a shell. You don't need to lay your eggs in the water. So now we have reptiles um, descending from uh, these earlier uh, lineages that now okay they have amniotic eggs the eggs can be laid uh, on land now their bodies are somewhat like uh, amphibians they still have a, a three uh, chambered heart but now we move to species that are uh, predominantly uh, terrestrial so you know we still have some aquatic organisms like alligators and crocodiles uh, but um, those are more you know the exception than the rule so there you see how you have this uh, ancestral species produces these eggs and you see all sorts of diversification of uh, these different uh, reptile species including uh, birds and then we have this other group uh, that moves in another direction their jaws change different ways become mammals alright now all of these organisms that we've looked at here are the uh, reptiles that we looked at um, are cold-blooded animals, so their metabolism is affected by the heat uh, in their surrounding environment. The major branch that we see here is with uh, endothermic organisms. They generate their own heat. Now, uh, endotherms, uh, again, significant because by being able to produce and trap your own body heat, 
It allows organisms to be active at times when others are not and in locations uh, where others are not. So uh, they can self-regulate uh, with body temperature. Um, this is in part due to the uh, uh, creation of a, a four-chambered heart that's different from the uh, reptilian, uh, reptilian and uh, amphibian heart. Um, we'll get into the, the uh, mammalian heart here uh, later uh, in the semester. Uh, but um, again, a major step forward because it allows um, organisms to live in places where they couldn't previously. Now the group that we'll look at here, most closely related to reptiles, uh, is aves, the birds. Okay. Now birds, well, they have feathers and with uh, rare exceptions here, the penguins uh, and ostriches, they fly. Okay. Now it's awesome because there is uh, again an example of a transitional species. Archaeopteryx uh, has um, a dinosaur skeleton if you will, so it has this uh, reptilian skeleton, but uh, its fossils uh, have been found uh, to possess wings uh, with feathers. So you see this transition from a, a reptile-like species to more of a bird-like species. So you know we have the uh, adaptations for flight, the the contour feathers that help control airflow uh, over the wings, uh, the hollow bones with low density, all that kind of good stuff. Uh, kiwi bird, you know. Uh, Again, interesting organisms, uh, without a doubt, um, but remember they're still uh, amniotic, they're still laying those eggs. All right, now uh, we're going to get into mammals here uh, in the next lecture. Sweet.